Mexican senators pave way for the legalization of recreational marijuana. Argentina's president announces that his country made the upfront payment for 9 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines. And thousands of Israelis continue their months-long protest against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Hello, welcome to Telesur. I'm Carla Gonzalez. This is From the South. The Mexican Senate has approved a landmark recreational cannabis legalization bill in a landslide vote. Lawmakers are now rushing to secure a final approval before the end of the current congressional session in December. The legislation would let users carry up to 28 grams and grow as many as four plants at home. Sales to adults in authorized businesses will be allowed, provided the products abide by the maximum levels of psychoactive ingredients. Lawmakers in favor of the bill said it would also support indigenous communities, as they would no longer have to be part of an illegal cannabis market. But the use of cannabis will continue to be banned in public spaces if there are minors, and also in a 500 meters radius of schools, shopping centers, parks, and government buildings. Guatemala's Vice President Guillermo Castillo has urged President Alejandro Yamate to resign over his approval of an almost $13 billion budget, the largest in the country's history. This will raise the state's debt limits, which has incited protests and calls to veto it. Castillo says if the president agrees, he will also step down. Unfortunately, we had not success in today's meeting, and I would therefore like to make my approach very clear to the president. It is in the country's interest that we both tender our resignations, him as president and I as vice president of the republic. But let's do it together. I have made it very clear to the president that things are not right on many government issues and the decisions that have been taken I don't agree with. I have not been consulted on them because of the lack of communication we have with the president, this is also due to a citizen demand. We have been told that things are not as people hope. Another former FARC combatant has been murdered in Colombia. Jairo Lopez was gunned down in Putumayo, in the southwest region of the country on Friday. This has pushed the cumulative number of former guerrilla members killed since the signing of the 2016 peace agreements to 242. In northern Honduras, hundreds of people are awaiting help from rescuers as extensive flooding continues following the passage of hurricanes Eta and Iota. Authorities said part of, parts of San Pedro Sula and the capital Tegucigalpa have been the worst hit. The fire department reported that 16 people have been found dead while rescue workers are still searching for missing persons. Peru's new president, Francisco Sagasti, has said the proposals for a new constitution, as demanded by some sections of society during the recent protests, is not an urgent matter. Sagasti said his transitional government's immediate objective is to restore peace to the country, which experienced an intense week of protests after President Martin Vizcarra's removal. Demonstrators have demanded a reform of the discredited Congress and a new constitution, but Sagasti believes constitutional reforms is a task that should be left to the next elected government. As Brazilians prepare to mark Black Awareness Day on Friday, videos circulated on social media of a black man being beaten by security guards at a supermarket in the city of Porto Alegre, sparking outrage. According to reports, emergency services attempted to res resuscitate 40-year-old Joao Alberto Silveira Freitas, but he was already dead after being beaten by two white security guards, one of whom was an off-duty cop. A short video clip showed one guard restraining him outside the doors of a Carrefour supermarket, while the other inflicted repeated blows to his face. Other clips showed a guard kneeling on top of Freitas' back. Dozens of protesters demonstrated in the capital Brasilia on Friday morning, 
chanting Black Lives Matter. This as the incident bore similarities to the murder of George Floyd in the U.S. The security guards involved have been arrested on charge of aggravated homicide. What we saw in Porto Alegre is the most despicable expression of a structural racism, institutional racism, and how much Brazil still inherits from the heritage of the slave countries operating in the Americas. My brother Joao, who died, he is not just Joao, he is part of the black family, excluded from society for 500 years. And we are still here and see these expressions of anger, rage, racism. And protests have also broken out in the cities of Belo Horizonte and Rio de Janeiro. In Rio, demonstrators used tires to block the entrance of a Carrefour store and stuff them with sunflowers. Protesters chanted and demanded justice for all those killed by police in the country. Being black in Brazil means you have your humanity stolen. You have all your rights stolen. You don't have the opportunity to come and go in peace. You have the security system designed to have you as the accused. Even when you are the victim, you are the target of any bullet that circulates in the city. There is no bullet lost when it hits a black body. We'll be right back with more stories. Don't go away. For joining us again. Saudi Arabia is hosting the G20 summit this weekend with the virtual forum dominated by efforts to tackle the coronavirus pandemic and the worst global recession in decades. World leaders will gather virtually as international efforts intensify for a large-scale rollout of coronavirus vaccines after a breakthrough in trials. It also comes as calls grow for G20 nations to plug a $4.5 billion funding shortfall. Saudi Arabia's King Salman will preside over the meeting and climate change is expected to be among the issues topping the agenda. According to organizers, G20 nations have contributed with more than $21 billion to combat the pandemic, which has infected 56 million people globally and left 1.3 million dead. And they have also injected $11 trillion to safeguard the affected world economy. <coughs> and various world leaders have prepared video messages addressed to the G20 summit in Riyadh. Argentina's President Alberto Fernandez announced that his country purchased millions of doses of vaccines to cover 10% of the population. Argentina, se comprometió activamente Argentina actively engaged in the COVAX mechanism of the COVID-19 access accelerator and has already made the upfront payment for the purchase of 9 million doses of vaccines to cover 10% of the population. In this regard, phase three of the clinical trials of three vaccine candidates are being developed in our country. And we will also produce the vaccine developed by the University of Oxford, which will be distributed equitably from 150 to 200 million doses to Latin American countries. Meanwhile, Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador has pleaded for free and universally available vaccines and warns about excessive lockdowns as he addressed the virtual summit. Health is a fundamental human right that the state must guarantee. Medical care, vaccines and medicines must be free and universally available. Guarantee freedom in all circumstances and abandon the temptation to impose authoritarian measures such as excessive lockdowns or curfews. The economic rescue must be done from the bottom up first helping the poor. And in his address to the summit, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa called on developed nations to assist African countries to rebuild their economies that were negatively affected by the coronavirus pandemic and the low oil prices. We look to the G20, international partners, and the international finance institutions to work with African countries 
to help them rebuild their economies. The African Union has proposed several measures, including debt relief in the form of interest payment waivers and deferred payments. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson said that it is, it is only by joining forces that nations will defeat the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen some encouraging developments on vaccines in the past few weeks, which may offer a path out of the gloom. And the UK has committed to equitable global access for any vaccine, and I would like to see the G20 nations collectively step up and support that effort. Ahead of next month's Climate Ambition Summit, I'm calling on my fellow leaders at the G20 to make bold pledges and harness our collective ingenuity and resources to defeat the pandemic and protect our planet and our future for generations. German Chancellor Angela Merkel has called on G20 leaders to support the World Health Organization and calls for vaccines to be made available and affordable for all countries in order to contain the pandemic. In order to halt the pandemic, every country needs to have access to and be able to afford the vaccine. The funds pledged so far are not enough to achieve this. I therefore appeal to you all to support this important initiative. To this end, we need to sustainably strengthen the World Health Organization. We need reliable funding, better cooperation, greater independence, and the G20 can provide important, indeed crucial support in this area. If we stand together across the globe, we can control and overcome the virus and its impact. It is worth redoubling our efforts to achieve this. Meanwhile, Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte has said that this year's G20 summit must serve as a launchpad from which the world creates a new, better normal in a post-pandemic reality. The Riyadh summit will be an important milestone demonstrating the resolve of the G20 in addressing the global pandemic and its impact on each of our lives. The summit will reflect our commitment to rapidly recover from the crisis and to find solutions for the major challenges facing humanity today, from climate change to enduring inequalities. We must stand united and use the opportunities offered by this crisis to create a new, better normal. Italy, as the upcoming 2021 presidency, is determined to build upon the outcomes of the Riyadh Summit and to continue promoting the important action of the G20. Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sánchez has said G20 representatives must fight to achieve a fair world and to protect those most affected by the pandemic. We G20 leaders have an obligation to do everything in our hands to minimize the damage and the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. The world faced its greatest challenge in decades, and the biggest economies of the planet should live up uh, to the challenge of defeating the virus and build a greener, fairer, and more inclusive future. Spain looks forward to the Riyadh summit to decisively advance in this direction. We have a unique opportunity to establish a collective roadmap uh, that allow us to work for prosperity, sustainability, equality, and well-being, to work for the benefit of our economies, but above all, for the benefit of uh, all citizens and the entire planet. Let's get to work. In other news, Uganda's opposition presidential candidate Robert Kyagulani, aka Bobby Wine, has condemned the violent clashes between security forces and his supporters that left at least 37 people dead. The 37 died during two days of protests that were sparked by Wine's arrest on Wednesday, ahead of a political rally in the run-up to the January 14th election. The musician-turned-politician a, has appeared in court, will appear on Friday, for allegedly violating coronavirus measures at his rallies. Speaking after the court hearing, he accused President Yoweri Museveni of using COVID-19 restrictions to stop political opponents from campaigning. 
Museveni and these brutal people are on their way out. They have failed to account for the 35 years they've been in power. And now all they're left with is murder innocent people. Shame on them. He's facing a generation which is both hungry and angry. A generation which is resolved to stop at nothing to get their freedom. A generation which has said in the past and continue to say, we are not your slaves. Burkina Faso opposition leader Seferin Diabre said President Roque Cabore is orchestrating a massive fraud to secure a re-election in Sunday's vote and that he will not accept results marred by irregularities. It's clear, and we have denounced it on several occasions, that there is a huge orchestrated operation by those in power to carry out fraud on a massive scale to legitimize a certain knockout the day after November 22nd. We'll take a short break now. Join us again in just a minute. Thousands of Israelis took to the streets on Saturday night to continue months of protests, demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Braving cold, wet weather, several thousand people gather outside Netanyahu's official residence in Jerusalem. Some protesters carried makeshift submarines, referring to one of Netanyahu's graft scandals, which is connected to the purchase of the warships and submarines from a German conglomerate. The Prime Minister faces a trial for corruption and protesters also accuse him of mishandling the coronavirus crisis. Troops from Azerbaijan have entered a district bordering Nagorno-Karabakh that was previously home to Armenian separatists as part of a Russian broker deal to end weeks of fighting in the region. Troops on Friday moved into the district of Agdam, one of three to be seated. As part of last week's peace deal, Armenia agreed to return some 15 to 20 percent of the Nagorno-Karabakh territory captured by Azerbaijan in recent fighting, including the historical town of Shusha. Armenia will also hand over the Kalbajar district wedged between Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia on November 25th and the Lachin district by December 1st. Fierce clashes between Azerbaijan's forces and Armenian separatists broke out in late September in the Nagorno-Karabakh region. The fighting lasted six weeks, leaving thousands dead and displaced. Do you think it's easy to be a martyr? It is difficult. The war is over. The agreement was signed. Excellent. Very good. Because my son is in the town of Kojavent in Nagorno-Karabakh now. He's still there. I cried and I was happy. I was crying tears of joy. I hope the other districts will be returned. We are all calm now. We are all happy. Meanwhile, in Armenia, several thousand people have gathered again in the capital, Yerevan, to call for the resignation of Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan and to voice their opposition to a deal with Azerbaijan over the disputed region of Nagorno-Karabakh. The Armenian police had detained dozens of protesters on Friday at a similar rally in Yerevan where demonstrators formed a human chain and blocked major roads. The agreement ended military action and restored relative calm to the breakaway territory, internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, but populated and until recently fully controlled by ethnic Armenians. I returned from the military positions in Nagorno-Karabakh three days ago. We defended the positions and will defend them to the end. This later sold the country. Soon our platoon of the Armenian Revolutionary Federation will return from the Nagorno-Karabakh. Soon the Propashinia keeps saying the soldiers are with us. But soon it will become clear who is with whom. Today we gather here to demand the resignation of the traitor Nikol Pashinyan. A commander-in-chief who has been defeated has no right to remain at the helm of the country. 
Georgia has held runoff elections in several constituencies in a vote boycotted by the opposition. All of the country's opposition parties have staged mass protests after claiming the October 31st parliamentary elections were rigged. They want snap polls, a demand the ruling Georgian Dream Party has rejected. The government won 48% of the votes against 46% for opposition parties in a proportional ballot that decided 120 of the legislative's 150 seats. Opposition candidates have said they will renounce their mandates. There is no place for people who do not know how to behave in a governmental post. That is why there is an election process. Awareness of the population must be increased so that people know whom to vote for. Georgia will not succeed until party hegemony is overridden. What I see today is politicians spurring their own interests about the interests of the country, and they should be stopped. In the United States, around 74 endangered sea turtles that became stranded on Cape Cod have been airlifted to rescue centers. Each fall at Cape Cod Bay in Massachusetts, hundreds of endangered sea turtles wash ashore hypothermic from the cold ocean temperatures, leading to the largest sea turtle stranding event in the world. The organization um, will fly turtles and the volunteers who have loaded up a record-breaking 74 sea turtles to be flown on a single private aircraft to rehabilitation centers along the eastern seaboard. This will take place before being released into the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Most of the turtles are Kemp's Ridley, the smallest and most endangered species in the world. You couldn't write a more horrifying script for everybody, really. I mean, this is what, you know, in a good year, we, we could deal with it, and you could bring in more people, and now you can't. So now we have to deal with it. Each one of us, in our own way, has to find the time to recover from being out there, you know, all of the shifts and all of the walking, all of the lifting, and then get ready for the next, the next time, and make sure we have the infrastructure and that we're able to move turtles around and, 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 and get that all done. Once you save one, it's, you know, you're just hooked. I mean... I find that the, my fellow volunteers, they'll do just about anything, you know, like, okay, it's five degrees out with a 30 mile an hour wind, can you go out at 3 a.m., you know, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> so it's for the turtles, you know, we love them. Organizers of the 2022 FIFA World Cup in Qatar say they are optimistic for the upcoming event, despite the ongoing pandemic. According to the organizing committee, 90% of the infrastructure for the event is complete. The tournament will feature eight stadiums, with construction on three of them completed. Qatar will be the first Middle East and Arab majority country to host the competition. But the committee has also acknowledged that the COVID-19 pandemic has and will present numerous cha challenges, but they hope to be able to safely welcome as many visitors as possible. We still have two years until Qatar's FIFA World Cup kicks off, and we're optimistic that the first ball will be kicked in that new era, what we will all call the post-COVID world. Now, since COVID-19 was first reported in Qatar in March, the virus has presented us with numerous challenges that we have faced head-on. These include protecting the welfare of workers, building our infrastructure, creating a safe environment to play competitive sports, and adjusting our plans where necessary to ensure that we're ready for all scenarios ahead of 2022. And with that, we end this news brief. But remember that you can find all of our stories on our website, telesurenglish.net. And you can also follow us on social media. Until next time.